Okay, uh, hi everyone, welcome to the last lecture of this uh, mini course. So I was not uh, super happy how about my last lecture, how it went. I think I was uh, not very clear and um, so I'll, I'll try to correct myself, well, to clarify myself this time. So, okay, uh, we are considering, let us recall which problem we are considering. So we assume that we are given a Euclidean CFT and in this Euclidean CFT we are given a four-point function. We, are suppose, we suppose that we know the Euclidean CFT four-point function in Euclidean space. And the problem that we are considering, we are trying to construct or to define uh, four-point function, Whiteman function in Minkowski space. So we are trying to uh, to construct Whiteman function uh, in Minkowski space. And so in Minkowski space we have these coordinates xi, which are ti xi vector. Uh, and we have to define, given these coordinates, we have to define this Whiteman function in this operator ordering. And OK, uh, the recipe to do this is as follows. So uh, is that we have to, so these Euclidean points are uh, from which we start. Uh, we write them as uh, xi0, xi. Uh, so we start from Euclidean points with the same vector, with the same special part of the coordinates as the Minkowski coordinates we are aiming for. And then we are, so this is the first step. So the first step is that we are analytically continue we are supposed to analytically continue in the Euclidean times xi0 becomes now a complex variable. Let me write it as uh, tau i plus i t i. Uh, and then we, we are supposed to uh, scale all tau i to zero, but keeping the ordering tau one larger than tau two, larger than tau three, larger than tau four. And simultaneously, we are supposed to uh, increase the imaginary parts of this uh, complex Euclidean times, complexified Euclidean times from zero to the Euclidean times that, uh, to the Minkowski times that we need. So this tau i has to be scaled from zero to the final tau i. Tau I. So tau i uh, from zero uh, to the needed. And uh, so if we are able to perform this procedure, then the end result is going to be the Whiteman function in the Minkowski signature. So this is the recipe. And in fact, this recipe is, is completely general. It's not restricted to uh, conformal field theories. It, this is the procedure that we would be supposed to follow in any quantum field theory, conformal or not. Uh, and the problem that you have to face now, okay, given this recipe, is that how do you actually perform this analytic continuation? So you see the second step says that we are supposed to take the Euclidean four-point function, which is given us in the Euclidean space. We are supposed to somehow analytically continue to the complex coordinates. Well, how do you do this in general? Uh, quantum field theory uh, is a complicated task. But in a conformal field theory, we... Uh, we have a chance to perform this task. That's uh, here is where conformal symmetry helps us. So, so this is so this second step is 
uh, is difficult in general. But in CFT, there is hope. Uh, in CFT, mm, possible. So why is this possible in CFTs? Because in CFTs, we have this formula that the Euclidean four-point function has uh, the form GUV over x12 to the 2 delta, x34 to the 2 delta. And u and v are themselves uh, functions of uh, distances, Euclidean distances between points. So, uh, so you can hope that by using this formula, if somebody tells you what GUV is, you can perform the synthetic continuation. So that's why in CFTs we are in a, in a better shape. Uh, well, whether you can do this or not depends on the analytic properties of this function GUV. So the next step that we have to do, we have to discuss what is known about the analytic properties of this function's GUV in a general uh, conformal field theory. Yeah. Sorry, so what about the factors x12 to the two delta? You have to also worry about these factors. But, uh, uh, but fortunately for these factors, it's easy. You can check that is if you do this, if you perform this procedure, and if you keep the time ordering, as I said, tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, tau 4, then uh, these factors all along the continuation path, they are non-singular. So they only acquire some singularity when you go precisely to Minkowski space, where you can find some light cone singularities. And here, uh, you have to uh, you have to discuss. So there are two things that have to be satisfied. For first, all along the continuation path, the function has to be analytic. And then you have to discuss what happens when you go to the Minkowski, like the last uh, passage. And here, as I uh, discussed last time, there is fortunately this beautiful Vladimirov's theorem, which tells you that everything is going to be in good shape if, as you go to the Minkowski space, uh, nothing blows up faster than the power law. So this is something else that you have to check. But the first thing you have to check is whether all along the continuation path, things stay analytic. Yes. Let, let's finish, but then, uh, then Grisha can ask. Yeah, I mean, if, it's, if it would be that if, you, if there are space like separations, nothing will happen. But yeah. Of course, yeah, you have to cross the light cone. Mm -hmm. If you use this Vladimir's theorem, what, what do you get, let's say, for, for a two point function or for such a, a factor x1 to the two delta? Does, does it give you a, a transcription of what happens if you cross this light cone? You don't cross it. That's the point. That if you stay this, uh, if you if you keep if you stick to this time ordering, you clean time ordering tau one, tau two, tau three, tau four, you only arrive to the light cone singularity at the last moment. But all the way all along the path, this factor x one two squared is going to have a non-zero imaginary part, so it's not going to be zero. It will the imaginary part of this factor will vanish only at the last moment. And it will vanish in a, in a way which, uh, in a power law way. And so you will be able to apply Vladimir's theorem to claim that this factor is a distribution. Yes. So to contextualize the conceptual question. Yes. Because I'm just saying stay in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, yeah, I only so, so far only wrote this function for the Euclidean correlator. Yeah, yeah. My question is if I were only in the post space, I don't know any systematic reason, but I'm in the post space, I just want to order it on the jury. Yeah. Uh, yes. So therefore, I cannot formulate some form of symmetry what is additive for the correlation function in the space to predict what I'm ordering. 
Uh, well, that's a slightly uh, that's uh, a slightly different question than the one I'm discussing right now. Uh, this issue exists, in fact, that if you are in Minkowski space, uh, then uh, you can you 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 can formulate the um, uh, what does it mean for correlation functions to be conformally invariant? And what you are saying is that uh, that's something that I will have to discuss in the second part of my lecture today. Is that when you apply a finite conformal transformation in Minkowski space, then uh, you may find yourself that two that it changes the the causal uh, structure of the two points, uh, and this is indeed the case. But uh, but nevertheless, if you apply an infinitesimal, so if you want to write an infinitesimal word identity. It will work perfectly well in Minkowski space as well. So there is a little paradox. Th so there is a little. So this formula, you can justify it based on finite conformal transformation, but you can also justify it on infinitesimal conformal transformation. So for this formula as such is valid since it can be justified also by infinitesimal conformal transformations. It's valid also in Minkowski space. But there is still a little paradox that that I will discuss in the second part of my lecture today is that what happens like how do you should think about finite transformation. But uh, okay, so let's go back where I was. So I, I, I start with this formula, and I would like to perform this step, which is analytic continuation. And as I said, we have to know something about if we want to discuss a general CFT, what is known in a general CFT about this function GUV. Of course, if somebody just gives you a beautiful formula. Maybe you can just figure it out from the formula. But if you want to be general, what do we know? And, uh, and in order to understand this analytic properties, I, uh, I said last time is that we, um, uh, we have to choose, instead of these coordinates u and v, we have to choose uh, slightly different coordinates. Actually, there are two sets of coordinates that are normally used for this purpose. One set with these coordinates z and z bar which are defined by u equals z, z bar, and v equals 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. So z bar is not a complex conjugate of z. It's just a solution of this quadratic equation. A and if you solve this equation, then you can find easily that z, z bar equals 1 half uh, 1 plus u minus v plus or minus square root of 1 plus u minus v squared minus 4u. So I instead of writing this function g as a function of u and v, as a first, uh, as a, as a first uh, formula, let us write it as a function of z and z bar. And then it, it takes an interesting form. So as I said last time, the meaning of this coordinate z and z bar is that you fix one point at zero, one point at infinity, one uh, at one point at one, and then the last point in the two-dimensional plane with light cone coordinates. Well, I mean, in Euclidean, there's going to be z bar equals z complex conjugate. Uh, and so the function of GUV actually can be written nicely in terms of the z z bar. It's going to be in any CFT, in any unitary CFT, it will look like this. There are going to be some positive coefficients, p delta l. And then uh, let's write it more in detail than I did last time. There's going to be the first term, which is going to be z, z bar to the power of delta over 2 minus l over 2. And so the sum is going to be over delta and l which corresponds to operators uh, present in the CFT and exchanged in this four-point function. And then this factor, z, z bar, which is non-analytic if delta is not integer, uh, is going to be multiplied by a polynomial of the following structure. It's going to, be, uh, it's going to look like z to the l plus some coefficient uh, z to the l minus 1 z bar uh, plus dot, 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 plus z bar to the l. Uh, so there's going to be some polynomial with positive coefficients. And uh, which is, in general, the dimensions. It's related to some sort of Gegenbauer polynomial, which we don't need its precise uh, form right now. But it's a polynomial. Well, L is a spin. 
uh, spin of a, of, 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 a, of a primary which is exchanged. And this, the reason why this structure appears is that when you rotate in this plane, uh, then uh, you have a, uh, a primary uh, of, of which has a, you have a certain state which in, in d dimensions has spin L. But then you decompose it in multiplets having particular spin with respect to rotations in this, in this plane that we chose. Then depending on number of dimensions, you will have uh, this multiplet will decompose in a certain way. And that's why you get this polynomial, which is Gegenbauer polynomial, depending on how many dimensions you work in. Um, so what is the, um, the, what are the important features of this formula? First of all, uh, this formula, the right-hand side, it's symmetric function of z and z bar. And uh, the reason is that, OK, you see that uh, you know, z, z bar defined by solving this quadratic equation. And there is no real, like if you're in Euclidean, there's no difference who to call z, who to call z bar. So it has to be a symmetric function, and it is. Um, another thing that, uh, that is important we can realize by looking at this formula is that we can use this formula for analytic continuation because it's possible to show that the right-hand side of this formula converges, uh, converges for z, z bar less than 1. So in other words, the logic is like this. If you're in Euclidean, if you're in Euclidean space, z bar is actually a complex conjugate of z. But let us write this formula. And uh, when we analytically continue, when we take the, the time complex, z bar is no longer a complex conjugate of z. But as long as both z and z bar stay in absolute value less than 1, we can use this formula to perform analytic continuation. And as I discussed last time, OK, yeah, this allows you to define the minkowski whiteman functions in a certain region of Minkowski space, but not everywhere. So it turns out that this formula is not powerful enough to give you analytic continuation everywhere you want. Yes? And do you have a bound on d dash i, or is it just uh, There is some. You can derive some power law bounds on spectral density p delta l. But in fact, to prove that this series converges, you don't need this bound. Because um, since you know that these coefficients are positive, and since you know that this, this series defines a four-point function, if you assume that the four-point function is finite, there are various ways to argue. Uh, so, so this formula is nice, but it doesn't give us all we need. So we need a more powerful formula. And so this, as I explained, is obtained by uh, considering this other coordinate, rho, which is defined in terms of z by 1 minus square root 1 minus z divided by 1 plus square root of 1 minus z, or analogously z equivalently z equal 4 r for rho divided by 1 plus rho squared. So as I said, this, this formula is nice because if, if z belongs to, uh, to the complex plane minus the cut 1 plus infinity, then this is equivalent to rho being in the unit disk. So we can write exactly the same type of formula. So let me just write it below. So there's another formula which is, has exactly the same structure as this one, except that it has different coefficients, q, delta l, which are also non-negative, just like these coefficients. And then just replace everywhere uh, z by rho. And here again, some polynomial, rho to the l to the dot. Um, and just like the first formula was convergent for z, z bar less than 1, the second formula is convergent for rho, rho bar less than 1. But since uh, we have this correspondence, so the region rho, rho bar less than 1 covers a much larger region in the z space, 
And, and so you can hope that using this formula, we can perform analytic continuation everywhere we need. Well, if this formula doesn't work, then we are screwed because there's no other interesting formula we can use. So either this works or we are screwed. So the game becomes very simple. You, you can play it on a, in Mathematica on a computer. Well, pick your favorite points Ti, uh, pick this continuation contour, xi0 tau i plus i ti. Uh, so the you, can, you can take a contour x i0 equals 1 minus s tau i plus s i tau i, and then vary s from 0 to 1. Given these points, you can compute u and v. By the, by, because u, u is given and v is given in terms of distances, you compute u and v, which are some complex numbers. You solve this quadratic equation. You compute z and z bar. Uh, then you compute rho by this formula. You make a plot how rho varies when you vary coordinates. And you see, is it going to stay in the unit disk or is it going to cross the unit disk, cross the boundary? Uh, if it doesn't cross the boundary, then we win. Of course, uh, th there is another possibility. So perhaps it doesn't cross the boundary, but at the very end of the analytic continuation, it arrives to the boundary. Then uh, we have this situation that we have to study what happens, how fast it approaches the boundary of the unit disk in order to show that there is a power law bound. Uh, Yes, yes, we have to find this part. But, uh, but <coughs> yeah. Nice well, let's just, I mean, you can, in principle, um, I propose just to take the most simple, the, the simplest path. Uh, it's a straight line. And okay, let's hope it will work. Uh, but of course, uh, there, is still, uh, there is still a little bit more uh, freedom in this game. So this game is not fully fixed because we have to feel we have to p pick an OPE channel. Because you see, we have a Euclidean, uh, we have a Euclidean four-point function, and we can expand it. So here, when I wrote this expression uh, for uh, correlation function as this power series expansion, uh, I wrote it uh, picking a particular OPE channel. In this particular case, I picked the so we picked. Uh, OPE channel 1, 2, 3, 4. But I can pick other channels. There are, there are two more channels, 1, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 4, 2, 3. And you may say, well, I mean, what difference does it make which channel you pick? Well, it, you may expect that it can make some difference because you see, I'm trying to construct a Minkowski four-point function in some particular times and positions. And uh, and suppose like the points one and two are like light years away and points two or three are very close to each other, then maybe you, you may suspect that perhaps you have to pick a channel, two, three, a P channel in order to construct this uh, Minkowski four point function. And then some other position of points, maybe you have to pick another channel. So uh, strictly speaking, you may think that perhaps which channel to choose will depend on which on, on the positions of space-time points that you're trying to analyze. That would be one possibility. But actually, it turns out that that's not what happens. It turns out that the channel which you have to pick, it only depends on the operator ordering. So if you are ordering operator like that, phi x1, phi x2, phi x3, phi x4, then the channel you have to pick is always the channel which, which will always work is 1, 2, 3, 4. So it doesn't matter how far the points 1 and 2 become in the Minkowski space. As long as the operator is ordered like that, the claim is that, uh, that um, 
you pick this analytic continuation contour, and it will never cross the boundary of, uh, of the unit disk. So that's the claim. That's our claim. So let me. Mm, uh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that. Uh, thanks for this question. I'll, I'll comment on this in a second, but let me, I'll need some space. Well, this formula, I might need it. Well, let me erase this for. So, so as I said, we play this game. So we, ca we take this uh, analytic continuation path. We compute U and V. We compute Z and Z bar. And then we would like to know if Z and Z bar, so there is this cut from 1 to infinity. Uh, if Z and Z bar do not cross this cut, then it means that rho is going to remain in the unit disk. So we just. It's enough to compute z and z bar. And so what do you see? OK, there is this point 0. So you start. This is the initial configuration. When we are in Euclidean space, z bar is complex conjugate of z. Now you start analytically continuing. What do you see? Uh, if you pick this OPE channel, 1, 2, 3, 4, which corresponds of course, the channel that you will pick, it, it, it influences. So we, we said that we have always picked tau 1 larger than tau 2, tau 3, tau 4. So th this is the important thing. So what you see is that z, you know, you may see picture like, OK, z maybe will go like this. And it will end up with some real value. And z bar maybe will go like this. And it will end up again at some real value. But it will never cross this cut, uh, 1 from 1 plus infinity. So if you pick another channel, then for some configurations, for some time configurations, and for some x configurations, it will work. But it will not always work. There's, for any other channel that you will pick, there are always going to be some coordinate configurations for which it will not work. So what, will, what does it mean that it will not work? It means that uh, you will see that z uh, will go through through the cut, and maybe we'll go around something like that. This is what you will see. But this does not happen for one, two, three, four channel. Uh, they, no, the Z and Z bar don't have to be in the unit disk around zero because we're now working in terms of the row coordinate. So the dangerous, the only dangerous uh, set that we have to avoid is the cut from one to infinity. So you compute U and V, you compute Z and Z bar. They do not necessarily uh, belong to unit disk, but they are always complex conjugate to each other. They could, they could be anywhere in this plane, but they are complex conjugate. And then uh, complex conjugate, as long as this parameter s is 1, which means that uh, imaginary part of uh, xi0 is 0. But, but then you're saying that for this particular way of taking the bound, that there could always be Well, I mean, sometimes it will not go like this. Sometimes, it, you know, it's interesting. It was another comment that I wanted to make, that it's also in interesting to know how many times z went around uh, the origin. Sometimes it will go around the origin, maybe once or twice. Sometimes it will not go around the origin. Sorry? Well, because you see, um, if you want to compute the final value of the Whiteman function, uh, as I said, the terms in the Whiteman function, okay, in terms of z or in terms of rho, they look like some function uh, which is raised, z, z bar, which is raised to a non integer power times a polynomial. So of course, this polynomial part, it's not sensitive to this number of times z went around the origin. But this prefactor, z, z bar to the delta over 2, it's sensitive. So in other words, if you want to know 
if you want to compute the value of the Whiteman function, the final value of the Whiteman function, it's not sufficient to just know uh, the final values of z and z bar, but it's also important to know how many times it circled around the origin uh, when you did this a continuation path. This is a simple way to figure out how many times it's circled. I, I don't want to make it sound too mysterious. It's an easy computation to figure it out, but you have to figure it out. No, it will not depend on a particular path. Because it, it, it has to vary continuously under the deformations of the path. And you can show that Z uh, can never vanish. Z and Z bar can never vanish along this path or along paths of this type. And so uh, the, the phase never depends on the path. So there is some well-defined procedure. But of course, you have to prove this. So, so I, I'm making this claim that for this particular path, it never, so this is a magic path. This is a magic P channel for which, uh, it, which, it, which will always work. Uh, but, uh, but you need to prove this. Uh, so this is something that you can play with. You can make a lot of numerical experiments, but, and it always works, but you have to prove. So uh, I actually think that I, I gave enough proofs in this lecture already for a physics course, and, uh, and not all of them were a big success with this audience. Uh, so I will, not, I will not give you a proof, but we have a proof. And you can read about it in the lectures. Uh, I can I can tell you like what is the structure of the proof. So in fact, uh, there are different strategies that you can pursue. So one strategy would be okay. Let me just compute. Suppose that I found explicit formulas for Z and Z bar, and then just by staring at these formulas, maybe I can convince myself that it never crosses the cut. So this strategy works, uh, but only in two dimensions. Because in two dimensions, uh, as I said last time, there is a nice formula which, given four points in the complex plane, uh, so in d dimensions, the formula there is a formula which only computes in a simple way u and v. But in two dimensions, since u is z z bar, everything factorizes, so you can compute also z separately just in terms of so in in general d we have u equals x12 squared x34 squared divided by x13 squared x24 squared but and two in 2d you can just uh, convince yourself that this formula implies a formula for for z itself in terms of z's of each of the four points, z1 z minus z2, z1 minus z3, z2 minus z4. And using this formula, you can show that uh, this continuation path always works. But this strategy doesn't work in, uh, in higher dimensions, because there is no just simple formula. You cannot fi find any simple formula. So th the strategy that you found uh, was this. So there are some configurations uh, for which you know that uh, z and z bar have to be real. So these are configurations which correspond to reflection positive uh, positions of points. You can generalize the notion of reflection positivity from U Euclidean signature to, uh, to Minkowski signature. And for those configurations, z and z bar uh, have to be real because correlation function has to be real. You know this kind of, you suspect this. And it turns out that for those configurations, you can actually compute. There is a nice formula which computes you the value of z and z bar. And you can show that for those configurations, z and z bar doesn't cross the path. Like it doesn't cross the cut. But then for a general configuration, uh, you can show that uh, Rho for a general configuration satisfies some sort of cauchy schwartz inequality that it can be bounded by a square root of 
two values of rows computed for reflection positive configurations that you know and by this sort of cauchy schwartz inequality you can show that even in the general configuration rho does not cross the path uh, the, the cut so it's a fairly elaborate argument which is uh, uh, which you can read about in the notes or in wait for the upcoming paper so instead of giving you the full proof i i will better give you a few examples on how this recipe works in some situations of physical interest unless there are questions so um, Uh, I don't know general uh, good answer to this question. It has to be uh, kind of studied case by case basis. So in fact, uh, there are interesting, so in one of my examples, I will discuss the following situation. Uh, so as I said, this channel, this magic channel always works, but what does it allow you to show? It allows you to show that the correlation function in Minkowski space is sometimes a function, but sometimes it can only allow you to show that it's a distribution. So when does this happen? Well, this happens if the continuation path in terms of this z and z bar variable uh, somehow ends up on the cut, precisely on the cut. Doesn't cross it, but ends up on the cut. Then using this channel, we can only show that the correlation function is a distribution. But uh, you might say, well, maybe it's uh, too pessimistic. Maybe actually it's not just a distribution, but it's a function. Uh, but we don't see it using this channel. But maybe if we were to use some other channel, we could show more. And in fact, this sometimes happens, that in some of the regions of the Minkowski space where using this channel, you can only conclude that the function is a distribution. Using some other channel, uh, you can show that in fact, it's a, it's a better uh, object. It's a, it's a smooth function. So I don't say that other channels are uh, useless. Other channels are also useful. Uh, but they are only useful in some particular portions of Minkowski space. And it's, it's very important to have a channel which covers the whole Minkowski space because there are some uh, singularities, like double light cone singularities, which you could approach like using different channels. You can approach from different sides. But if you have to use one channel to approach it from one side, another channel to approach it from the other side, you never know like what happens exactly at the, at the double light cone singularity. But our claim is that this channel works like straight through the double light cone singularity. It, it was, works on all sides of this double light cone singularity. And so it can be used to figure out what happens at the double light cone singularity. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I will define it. It's going to be one of my examples. I, I think I already defined it, but I'll define it again. Okay, so I hope uh, I demystified some of the things that I didn't explain very well last time. Uh, so let me now do some examples. So my first example is going to be uh, to uh, about the so-called Reggi kinematics. Uh, 
So th this is often discussed in, uh, in contemporary uh, CFT literature. So what, what people mean by that is this. So you take, uh, you consider a four-point function, and you try to model uh, in a CFT uh, something which morally looks a little bit like a scattering process. So of course in CFTs there, there's no uh, really particles. So you cannot talk about the S matrix, but you are, you're trying to cook up some object or some limit from a CFT which should have some properties morally similar to the S matrices in, in theories of particles. And so the way people do it usually is that they take a four-point function. So this is, you, this is Minkowski space. So these are the, the two light cones. It's enough to work in 2D for this example. So you take this configuration where uh, points, there are two points which are pairwise light-like separated and other pairs are space-like separated. And you kind of, you would like to take a limit where these uh, two points, all, every, all points have become closer and closer to the light cone. So this kind of a limit that you would like to take. Uh, and then it's called Reggie limit, and people study what uh, CFT correlation functions do in this limit. It's interesting to study this question. But I, so I will not, I will not study the limit itself. For my example, I'll just take some particular configuration corresponding to some particular boost. And uh, well, before you study the limit, you would like to understand, well, do we know the CFT correlation function in this kinematics? <coughs> How do we compute in this kinematics? And uh, so the one thing to do is that you can apply a boost and to find uh, an equivalent configuration where you put two points at time zero. Let us assume that everything is symmetric. Uh, and then two other points now become even more boosted further away, closer to the light cone. So you, you kind of, you, you apply the boost which goes in this direction, then in this direction. And by doing this boost, you moved the points from this configuration to this configuration, which is the one that I'm going to study. So here I'm, I'm taking, <coughs> so this is time, this is x. So this is 1, this is minus 1. So this is the four-point function that I would like to study. And um, so I'm assuming that this is fixed at some points t tx, and this is symmetrically at minus t minus x. <coughs> and since we are interested in a, in a scattering quote-unquote process, it means that we would like to consider our correlation function where the ordering of the operators corresponds with the time ordering. So, so we, let, me, let me order points in a weird way. So I will call this point 1, this point 2, this point 3, this, uh, and this point number 4. Uh, and the ordering of the correlation function that we are interested in is this one. Phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, and then phi 1 is the last, or, or the first. Because here it was like 2, uh, 3, 4, 1. But OK, 3 and 4 are space-like separated, so their order is not important. Um, but 3 and 4 are space-like separated, so how I order them is not important. So that's, uh, that's, this is the correlation function that, that we would like to uh, compute. And if we know our recipe that I explained, we know that to compute this correlation function, I have to use the channel, the OPE channel, the 2, 3 OPE channel. I know this. This, cha this channel will always work. So we will use it in a second, but let me first do something 
uh, which is not as smart, just to see where the difficulty is. And, uh, and suppose that I, I will say, OK, but uh, a very nice channel to use is the channel 1, 2. So it, it looks like. So first, first try. Let's use OP channel. One, two. So why is this particular nice? Well, because this channel simplifies kinematics since everything is symmetric with respect to the origin. Uh, this this channel is uh, is very nice, and um, uh, and in fact. Um, No, by okay, uh, there is operator ordering and there is time ordering. So operator ordering just means okay, in which order the operators are multiplied. Time ordering is you look at the list of times and see uh, um, how times are ordered. So I'm saying that I in this particular case, the operator ordering co coincides with the time ordering. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it means that when I will uh, start defining this correlation function by rotating from um, a Euclidean space, I will give every time a small imaginary part, and I will see that, yeah, the, that the imaginary part is, be, is going to be proportional to, to Minkowski time. So it's going to be nice, yeah. Yes? Uh, well, uh, no, that's uh, that's not the case because you are only. Uh, no, that's not the case. And uh, already you you are not, for example, you know that one and two are uh, space-like separated. So if they were located in a correlation function next to each other, then you could commute them. But you see, I'm considering a correlation function that where they are not located next to each other. So, um, wouldn't factorize either. Yeah, so it's not a good answer. Uh, so, so you're saying since one and four are time-like separated, and three and two are time-like separated, you're saying you're, you're basically saying, is it true? in any quantum field theory that if I just take a correlation function which consists of two groups of operators and these two groups of operators, they are completely uh, space-like separated to each other. Is it true that the correlation function factorizes? It's not true. I guess what I'm saying is like if I were to experimental that, yeah. and I said that, look, half of my apparatus, the one for half is in this, half of that. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, if I were writing an experimental paper, I would put it as a totally convincing evidence that those two pieces of equipment are completely unrelated to each other. Yeah, but in the it means that they commute. It doesn't mean that they are, they are factorized. Let us just let us look at at the example that will convince you that there's definitely uh, if if you were arguing like that you would arrive uh, arrive into a paradox. Let's consider a two point function. Suppose that instead of talking about a four point function, I take a two point function of an operator located here and an operator located there, which are space like separated. So if uh, you were right, I would say, well, two-point function factorizes, so it has to be factorized in the product of one-point function times one-point function, and one-point function is zero in the CFT. So you would just say that this two-point function has to vanish, okay. Oh, yeah. which is not true. In instead, the, cur the commutator of these two operators would would vanish, but not the two-point not the two-point function itself.
No, but even physically what you're saying is not really true because, uh, because okay, th there is some wave function of the vacuum in which these two operators act. And this wave function of the vacuum, there is a lot of entanglement in it. So uh, in, in fact, so when, um, when the quantum field settles in its vacuum state, uh, there is a lot of uh, long-range correlation, like EPR, like if you use correlation. So there's definitely uh, some wave function here speaks to wave function there. There's some, um, yeah. So yes, yes, yes. It's, uh, that's the case. But anyway, it was a thought-provoking question. So thank you for that. Um, so, uh, but. Um, so what, uh, let me come back to this uh, problem that we are discussing. So I'm saying, okay, uh, if, I first, if I first try uh, in OP channel 1, 2, then it's, uh, I, the computation is really easy to make because uh, I, uh, uh, I know that if I consider in Euclidean signature, so if I consider in Euclidean signature uh, the same kind of configuration, minus 1, 1, and then two points somewhere here. Then, uh, as I said, that in this symmetric configuration, the coordinates of this point are precisely rho and rho bar. So, so I take rho equals x plus iy. And this is uh, minus rho, so equals minus x uh, minus iy. And uh, the imaginary parts here that I have in Euclidean space, positive and negative, uh, they precisely correlate with the fact that I, I am trying to con consider, uh, to construct a Minkowski correlation function where uh, the operator 2 is, uh, is to the future and operator 1 is to the past. So everything is, uh, is precisely as we need. So, uh, so it, what it means is that I just analytically continue. I start from this symmetric configuration in Euclidean space and I can reach a symmetric configuration in Minkowski space just by analytically continuing y, which goes to uh, 0 plus uh, plus it. So this is the analy analytic continuation that I need to perform. And so it means that in this configuration that I reach, I find rho is equal uh, x minus t plus i0 plus and rho bar is equal x plus t minus i0 plus. And so, uh, so I can, well, in other words, it's very easy to, to find what rho and rho bar is for this configuration if I'm using the 1, 2 channel. Well, it's very, f it's very easy to find this rho and rho bar, but now you see already uh, that uh, this channel is not going to work always. Because if it's only going to work if rho and rho bar are less than 1, so this one is not going to work, is not useful for uh, x plus t larger than 1. So the moment you cross this dashed line, as you put the, uh, the point tx to the right of the dashed line, this 1 2 p channel becomes uh, useless. You cannot compute the correlation function using this channel. So this is just a, a, as an example of for some channels work only in some finite region of Minkowski space, not everywhere. So, th so it's not trivial that we have one channel that works everywhere. So let us now see what would the situation look like with uh, with the other channel, so th this channel one two doesn't work, but so. No, I take rho equals x plus i y. Rho bar rho is equals <laughs> x minus i y. Uh. So I fix these expressions, and now I analytically continue y, but keeping this coefficient plus uh, plus i and minus i fixed. So this is minus rho and, of course, minus rho bar. So and after the analytic continuation, this axis becomes rho bar and this axis becomes rho. So 
So now I would like to convince you that the channel 2.3 is going to work. But I would like to convince you in that without doing any complicated computations. So So let me try to do this. So let me draw the row plane, row and row bar plane. Uh, and um, so let me, let me first uh, draw in this plane. Let me consider the case that x plus t is larger than 1. So I know that the one two PA channel doesn't work, so Robar is going to get out of the uh, of this unit disk. So let me draw the situation. So what's going to happen is that, and on the other hand, I would like also to assume that x minus t is smaller than one. So let me draw the contour, no, not the contour, the paths which correspond to, to analytic continuation from Euclidean to Minkowski corresponding to this situation. So I start in the Euclidean from rho bar complex conjugate, then I do analytic continuation. At the end, I end up rho becomes equal to x minus t, which is less than 1. And rho bar becomes x plus t, which by assumption is larger than 1. So something like that happens. So 1, 2 channel doesn't work. So what does this correspond to in the z plane? In the z plane, again, I start uh, with complex conjugate z, z bar. z goes to some value uh, which is on the interval 0, 1. But z bar, the fact that rho goes out of the unit disk, it means that z bar crosses the cut and goes to some real value. But it does so by, while, by crossing this cut from 1 plus infinity. So I'm, I'm just um, rephrasing the fact that this channel doesn't work in terms of the z variable. But now let's go to the 2-3 channel. So this was, this was for the 1, 2 channel. This was for the 1, 2 channel. But now I would like to draw the picture for the 2, 3 channel. And I'm claiming that it's very easy to do this because the 2, 3 channel and the 1, 3 channel, they are related by z goes to 1 minus z and z bar goes to 1 minus z bar. Because you see, when I interchange the points 1 and 3, it's precisely the, I, I'm, I'm interchanging the S channel and the T channel with the OP, and it acts very simply on Z and on Z bar. So now I look at this picture. So I know how the Z and Z bar varied for, for the 1, 2 channel. And I can now draw the picture very easily for Z and Z bar, how they vary for this channel. So first, let me draw it for Z. So I just go. Uh, so it starts from uh, somewhere here, and it goes. So let me denote it uh, z prime equals 1 minus z, z bar prime equals 1 minus z bar. So z prime does something like that. So I, I look at this curve, and I just perform the transformation 1 minus z. So it, it ended up on this interval 0, 1, and it still ends up on the interval 0, 1. And it's OK. Nothing bad happens. Z can be greater than 1. Yeah. I just have to watch that it doesn't cross this, uh, this problematic cat, cut. Otherwise, it can do whatever it wants. But now let's look at that Z bar. So Z bar was going like this. But now after this transformation, Z bar goes to 1 minus Z bar. In, it will now do something like that, clearly. So it goes around the origin, but it doesn't go through the cut. 
So this is z bar prime. So what does it mean? It means two things. First of all, that, um, uh, that if I use the 2, 3 OPA channel, then I can compute the correlation function in the Reggie kinematics as a convergent power series expansion. So in particular, it's not a distribution. It's, it's really a, a function. And the second thing, because there is, there is this z bar going around the origin, circling like this, it means that there's going to be some phase in, uh, in this um, expansion. So there's going to be some non-trivial phases. It's not, going to be, uh, it's not going to be positive. And in fact, uh, these phases, they play uh, a very interesting role in, uh, in, uh, in recent work uh, related to the Caron Thoth's inversion formula. Because if you take this phase, if you take a complex conjugate, and uh, people dis consider so-called double discontinuities to, to, to focus on this phase, to, to think about these phases. Uh, and so, the, the, those, so this configuration was, has been discussed a lot in the literature related to the, in particular, to the current Thoth formula. Uh, and now we just see that, uh, yeah, it, it fits, uh, it fits uh, nicely our general theory. So there's no surprise. Um, so, what else uh, do I have to say about this, uh, unless there are any questions? I can, I can say one more thing, I can add one more thing. Suppose that uh, instead of, suppose that instead of considering this particular operator ordering, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, phi 1, which is important for energy physics, suppose that for some reasons, which are unclear to me why I would do it, but suppose that I would like to consider this operator ordering. Um, this is a different operator ordering. This is a different Whiteman function. And for this operator ordering, one two of e channel, according to our criterion, should work. But now notice that that this operator ordering, it only since it uh, it um, in Minkowski space it has exactly the same coordinates as the original, so it's only the ordering which matters. So it means that the Minkowski space values of u and v are going to be the same. And, and the Minkowski space values of z and z bar are also going to be the same. So in particular, in the first case, they were real, z and z bar in the Minkowski space. So for this ordering, they are going to be also real and the same. The only thing that will depend on the ordering is the path that you will get from Euclidean z and z bar to the Minkowski z and z bar. And, uh, we saw that for the first ordering, z bar was going through the cut. You can now do the calculation for this ordering. And you will find that for this ordering, it will not go through the cut, but it will kind of go straight to the same point without crossing the cut. And so you are computing z and z bar uh, correlation function for the precisely the same z and z bars. But in one case, you can use the one-two channel, and everything is going to be convergent. In the other case, you could not use the one-two channel. You had to go to the two-three channel. So, th so these are the kind of issues that uh, you have to deal with when you are considering um, Minkowski space uh, Whiteman functions. Yeah, yeah, that will always work. Is there some uh, check on the solution or the one or Well, I said that uh, you always pick always the channel which corresponds to the two operators acting on the vacuum. And you will, and, and uh, th this is going to be the first, this will always work. And this is going to be your first handle on the situation. And then other channels, 
you can explore them later on if they give you any, any additional information. Yes. So for the first whitening function, it seems like nothing special happens when one and two now cross the right thing. Uh, when one, one and two cross the light cone, uh, no, something happens because um, uh, what happens if you, if, you, if you approach to the light cone, what happens is that Z bar, uh, is that Z bar, no, Z prime, Z prime becomes very close, uh, go, goes to this end point of the cut. And so, uh, it means, okay, first of all, there's going to be certain singularity, but also it means that as you cross the light cone, Z prime is now going to go along the cut. And it means that the correlation function there on the other side of the light cone constructed using this procedure, you will only know that it's a distribution. But, but in another channel, this going to the light cone will actually mean going to the other side of the origin, right? If I send z to z prime, which is one minus z, and z bar is prime. You mean this? You mean uh, you mean in the two three channel or in the one two channel? Sorry. Uh, yes. Well, if one thing happens in one channel, then the other thing will happen in the other channel. Right? In particular, if z prime goes to z, z prime step on the right, then in the other channel nothing special. In the other channel. Uh, yeah, so you're saying that on the other side of the light cone, you might be better off using this, uh, using this. Um well, I was wondering, intuitively, I would have expected that something special would happen, but maybe for this particular Whiteman function, it doesn't, and only for this particular second board range. No, I, I haven't studied this, but it might be that on the other side of the light cone, uh, this channel 1, 2 maybe actually is going to be become good again. I don't know. It's, uh, I, I, I cannot answer it on the top of my head. But uh, uh, okay, so this was the first example. Let me, but actually, I'm like already, uh, already. I wanted to talk to you about the second example, but I think I will uh, leave it to the notes. And I will speak about something else that uh, interests me very much, is the <coughs> analytic continuation to the Lorentzian cylinder. Uh, so, um, as uh, those of you who work on ads safety know, uh, the boundary of the idea space, so here I have the idea space, and the boundary of the idea space is a cylinder, so a space with topology d minus one dimensional sphere times r. So we have uh, the time, Lorentzian time s, and uh, the, if you do idea CFT in Lorentzian signature in global ideas coordinates, then uh, the dual conformal field theory, it leaves on a on this Lorentzian uh, on this Lorentzian cylinder, uh, and uh, uh, so this is for ideas for theories with ideas dual. Uh, but actually, we will see that for any conformal field theory, correlation functions can be continued, not just to the Minkowski space, uh, but to the whole Lorentzian cylinder, which is a much larger space. So it's a much larger space because the Minkowski space is embedded into it. So that's something that people who do ideas safety also know. Uh, so there is something which is called a Poincare patch. So you get Poincare patch on uh, on the Lorentzian cylinder. Is if you you take one uh, one direction, you take two points, uh, which are just separated by some distance in. Uh, in the cylinder time, and then you uh, you emit. Uh, so this Lorentzian cylinder has a metric minus d s squared plus d omega squared, where omega is a vector on the d minus one dimensional sphere. Uh, so you emit light rays 
with respect to this metric, and uh, you choose the distance between these two points in such a way that these two light rays they meet at one point behind uh, on the other side of the cylinder, and then uh, this whole region uh, that is uh, contained between these two light cones is what is called Poincaré patch. And uh, uh, so what then what happens is that uh, the metric on the Poincaré patch, if you take a Lorentz cylinder and restrict it to this Poincaré patch, then the metric is uh, while equivalent to the metric on the flat Minkowski space. And so uh, that's how, if you now take correlation functions of the conformal field theory that we define in the whole Minkowski space, and if you embed them into the Lorentz cylinder, then the claim is that you can extend them outside of the Perenkara patch to the whole Lorentz cylinder. And so this construction is um, uh, has been first uh, described in a famous paper uh, by Lucher and Mack. Martin Lucher and Gerhard Mack in 1975. It's another communications of mathematical physics paper. Mm, who, yeah, who, who for the first time stated this result, uh, they, they attempted to, to say that in any control field theory, correlation functions can be continued uh, to the whole Lorentzian cylinder. So um, the reason, so they were interested in this problem for several reasons. And one reason uh, is um, in relation to a paradox uh, related to the finite conformal transformations in Minkowski space. So correlation functions in, uh, uh, in Euclidean space, they are related under infinitesimal conformal transformations and uh, also under finite conformal transformations, if you view them as acting on the, on the compactified, on the Riemann sphere, on the compactified Euclidean space. Now, if you go to the Minkowski space, then the correlation function in Minkowski space are invariant under, uh, under uh, infinitesimal conformal transformations, of course. But if you start exponentiating uh, this, uh, infinitesimal conformal transformations, then you find an interesting phenomenon. So you find, uh, like suppose that you take a certain endpoint correlation function and you start uh, applying the conformal transformation, so which moves these points around a little bit. Um, so you exponentiate this conformal transformation for a while. And then what you find is that at a, at a finite exponentiation parameter, uh, some of these points are going to move to infinity. So the reason why this happens is that uh, in, uh, uh, as you remember, well, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but you probably know it, is that some of the uh, conformal vector fields, they are uh, multiplied by, um, a function of x's, uh, in particular the ones which are uh, correspond to special conformal transformation, which are quadratic in x's. Now, th those vector fields, when you exponentiate them, it looks like you are solving a differential equation, something like f prime is equal f squared, and you know that this differential equation has solutions that blow up in finite time. And so after finite time, some points uh, are going to be moved to infinity. Now, this happens also of course, in Euclidean space, but in Euclidean space, all infinity is just one point, infinity, compactified Riemann sphere. So when this happens, the point moves to infinity, it just you know, moves on the Riemann sphere, comes in from the other side. So something like that happens also in Minkowski space. If you move the point to infinity, then if you keep exponentiating, then in Minkowski space, the point is going to come in from the other side. And uh, this on Minkowski space is problematic. So it was not problematic on Euclidean space, but on Minkowski space this is problematic because what can happen is that uh, you have two points, one which is in the future of the other, for example, it's in the future light cone. 
so this point x2 is in the future light cone of x1. And when it moved to infinity and it came back from uh, the other side, then it actually came back in the, it may come back in the past light cone of the point x1. So this means that conformal transformations, finite conformal transformations on Minkowski space, they do not uh, necessarily preserve causal ordering between points. Now, of course, uh, causal ordering is very important, and it means that uh, if you take a conformal, uh, if you take a con correlation function in Minkowski space of a conformal field theory, then even though it's invariant under infinitesimal conformal transformations, it will not be invariant under finite conformal transformations if causal causality is not preserved. So this is not possible. So this was a paradox which actually confused people a lot in the 70s when they started first thinking about conformal field theories. And so Lucia and Mack, uh, they who introduced first for the first time this Lorentzian cylinder, they uh, resolved this problem, uh, conceptual problem, by realizing that uh, this Lorentzian cylinder, you can view it as a, as a um, infinite covering of the Poincaré patch. And on this infinite covering, transformations, conformal transformations act in a way that if a certain point moves to the boundary of the Minkowski space, which is the boundary of the Poincaré patch, then if you keep exponentiating, since it's a covering space, the, the point just moves further away to the future, it, instead of coming back into the same space from behind. And so when the conformal transformations act on this Lorentzian cylinder, the causal ordering is preserved. And so in fact, this resolves the paradox because the correlation functions on the Lorentzian cylinder, they are perfectly conformally invariant, both under infinitesimal and finite conformal transformations. So that was nice. Um, and uh, what is, however, uh, a bit lacking in this old story is that, um, and it motivates us to revisit it, is that uh, the, when Lucia and Mark built their theory, they built it under some assumptions which are not exactly the same assumptions that we are now using. So in fact, their first assumption in their paper is that uh, they are considering a conformal field theory which is already defined in Minkowski space and satisfies Whiteman axioms in Minkowski space. So this is nowadays not the assumption that we would like to take. We would like to take a conformal field theory which is defined in Euclidean. And then whatever happens in Minkowski, we would like to build it up from the Euclidean assumptions. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that when Lucia and Mark defined these correlation functions on the Lorentzian cylinder, they defined it by a certain analytic continuation procedure that I will describe in a while. And as with any of these analytic continuations to the Minkowski space, you, uh, the construction consists of two parts. First, you have to find a contour along which uh, you do not encounter any singularities. But when you go to the Minkowski space, you know that on the Minkowski space, you will, you are certain to encounter some singularities on the light cones and not only on the light cones. And the best you can hope to show is that on the Lorentzian space, which is the cylinder in this case, the correlation functions are going to be distributions or temporal distributions. Now, this step, uh, Lucia remark, they uh, did not complete in their paper. So in fact, um, because they could not show that these analytic continuations that they constructed, that they grow not faster than the power law. So in fact, in their paper, if you read their paper, there is an epilogue in which uh, they say that it's a difficult uh, open problem to show that the correlation functions on the cylinder are defined all the way to the cylinder and are distributions there. So uh, here there's again some parallel uh, with, uh, with the work of Astrovalder and Schrader, meaning that uh, most physicists don't know that Lucia and Mack uh, did not complete uh, the job, and in fact, uh, if you read some literature on Lorentzian CFTs, recent literature, uh, then it sometimes contains erroneous claims that Lucia Remarque actually showed that correlation functions 
uh, Cambrian literature continued uh, to the Lorentzian cylinder. While they themselves say that they did not manage to do this. They would love to do this, but they did not manage to do this. Uh, so, for example, the, the famous ADS CFT review of Aharoni et al. It claims, it makes this claim that Lucia-Remarque actually showed this, which is not true. Uh, so they showed that epsilon away from the cylinder, everything is fine, but perhaps when you go all the way to the cylinder, things blow up out of control. That's something that uh, uh, that uh, that they did not manage to show, and so we need to. Uh, to complete their work, uh, this is still an open problem that need, needs to be completed. And fortunately, uh, what I would like to explain is that given all that we learned about analytic continuation to the uh, Minkowski space in the first lectures, it's very easy using exactly the same technology also to complete uh, the work of Lucian and Mack and to show that analytic continuation can be done uh, not just to Minkowski space, but to this larger Lorentzian cylinder. So with, with very little effort, you can solve also this problem. And so how do we do this? Uh, well, to do analytic continuation, we have to uh, choose some appropriate coordinates, as we have already seen several times in this course. And um, mm, so the first, first of all, we have to find uh, inside the Euclidean space, we have to find an Euclidean cylinder. That's the first step. And then from the Euclidean cylinder, we have to continue to the uh, Lorentzian cylinder. So how do we find Euclidean cylinder? Well, here we go in several steps. The first step is, is a very standard way uh, to find uh, Euclidean cylinder inside Euclidean space. Uh, you write the metric in the Euclidean space, dxi squared, in the radial coordinates. So it's dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. And then you, you make a substitution r equals e to the sigma. And then this metric becomes e to the two sigma uh, d sigma squared plus d omega squared. And so this uh, is precisely the metric of the Euclidean cylinder, r times s, s d minus 1. And this is a uh, while rescaling factor, which shows that the metric on the Euclidean cylinder is while equivalent to the metric in um, flat Minkowski space. So this was the first step. But this first step is not uh, yet sufficient for our purposes, because even though we found the Euclidean cylinder, we cannot yet analytically continue the metric in this form. And the so the analytic continuation would be like sigma goes to is. Uh, but we know, we see that if we do this analytic continuation here, we get the Lorentzian cylinder metric here. But here, the wire rescaling factor is not, uh, is not nice. It becomes complex. And also, um, uh, we see that, OK, this cannot be the right uh, choice of coordinates, because we know that when we analytically continue, we are not supposed to find the full Lorentzian cylinder, but we are just supposed to find um, the Poincare patch. OK, so then you do the second step. It's important to do the second step. You perform. Uh, a conformal transformation of, Minko of Euclidean space, uh, which sends the points 0 uh, and infinity to two points, which I will call n and s, north and south pole. And these points are uh, the points, so n is going to be, uh, n is going to be, Minus one. So I, I pick one axis, for example, x1 axis vertically, and I put, 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 pick n equals minus one, zero, zero, and s. Sorry, I mean, I, I usually the North Pole is to the north, but for me it's the other way around. Sorry about that. <coughs> 
So we can find the conformal transformation which maps zero infinity to n and s, which is just a special conformal transformation. And you uh, transform the metric written before this transformation, this radial metric, to the, uh, to the coordinates uh, you transform it to after this transformation. And then in these coordinates, so before we had this radial rays exiting from, this, from zero uh, to infinity, and after the transformation we have uh, some curves which connect S to N, and the spheres which surround the origin, now they become spheres which surround S, they expand kind of. Of course, spheres are mapped to spheres. <coughs> so in these coordinates that one can call NS coordinates, we have uh, x1 is equal to sinh sigma divided by cosh sigma plus omega 1. Uh, and xi is equal to omega i divided by cos sigma plus omega 1. So my, my space is still parameterized by sigma and omega. And if I choose this parameterization, then now uh, sigma goes to minus or plus infinity, it corresponds to x goes to uh, n or s. So notice that these coordinates, they cover all Euclidean space. So now I compute the metric in these coordinates, so dxi squared. And of course, since before the coordinate transformation from 0 infinity to ns, I had something while equivalent to the cylinder, I will still get something while equivalent to the cylinder. So this becomes 1 over uh, cos sigma plus omega 1 squared times d sigma squared plus d omega squared. So far so good. Uh, well, OK. Uh, in this form, I can now perform the rotation to the Minkowski cylinder, to the Lorentzian cylinder. Because now if I, uh, so now I perform the rotation sigma goes to I sigma, or maybe, maybe sigma goes to I s. So what happens is that uh, the metric becomes 1 over uh, cosine s uh, plus omega 1 squared ds squared plus d omega squared minus ds squared plus d omega squared. And the nice thing is that now if I look at the expressions for the, for the coordinates, so x1 becomes now i uh, sine s divided by cos s plus omega 1. And xi goes to omega i divided by cos s plus omega 1. And so now I just say that I, I call what multiplies i, I call this x1 Minkowski. Or maybe I better call it x0. 
So you see, after uh, everything happens so nicely in these coordinates that x1 really mapped into i times something which is real, which would not work in other in uh, before we did uh, transformation from uh, zero infinity to n s. And so this now becomes the, the left hand side of this equation becomes minus d x zero squared plus uh, d x i squared. So what does this mean? It means that on the right hand side, I have a metric on the Lorentzian cylinder. On the left hand side, I have a metric on the Minkowski space. They are conformally equivalent to each other, while equivalent to each other. And finally, I see that this equivalence doesn't work everywhere on the Lorentzian cylinder, but it only works in the patch so uh, this while equivalence, so the patch, Poincaré patch, it's uh, determined by the condition that cosine s plus, uh, plus omega 1 uh, has to be positive, negative. So and that's precisely what I, uh, what I Draw what I have drawn here. So we see that, uh, so this is S direction, right? And this is, uh, this direction is the omega 1 direction. So if, for example, uh, if, for example, omega 1 takes its maximal value, which is 1, then I get that s can vary from in the whole range, from, uh, from minus pi to pi. But if uh, omega 1 takes its smallest value, which is minus 1, which is the opposite point of the cylinder, then I get that s has to be 0. So the whole uh, Poincaré patch shrinks to just one point. And then, okay, for other angles that omega 1 forms, uh, <coughs> the range of s is reduced. So this is the origin of this Poincaré patch. So, uh, so this transformation, which was for the first time found by Lucher and Mark, it also, uh, there is nothing actually to be modified here. So we just have to to justify that this transformation can be used to, uh, to analytically continue correlation functions from Euclidean to the Lorentzian. So any questions about the choice of coordinates? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 While while transformation, sir. Yeah. No, no, it's not immediately clear. In fact, uh, I had to. I had to say. Uh, I had to make a comment about that. <coughs> So, yeah, so what is the role of, of the while transformation here? Why are while transformations are nice when we are uh, dealing with, with conformal field theories? So uh, there, is, uh, there is one more... Um, No, there is actually n nothing uh, else to say. Uh, what, what, I, what I want to say is this. So we have this relation between the metrics. Uh, this question can be asked already in, um, in the Euclidean signature. We have two metrics, uh, the Minkowski, uh, no, the Euclidean metric, which is flat, 
and the metric on the Euclidean cylinder, d sigma squared plus d omega squared. And they are related by this, uh, by this factor. So um, now, we have conformal transformations of the Euclidean space. So conformal transformations of the Euclidean space, they preserve the metric up to some x-dependent factor. So it, by this formula, we know that Euclidean transformation, Euclidean conformal transformation also gives rise to a conformal transformation of the cylinder because the two metrics are also related to the factor. Now, uh, uh, let us uh, take this flat space conformal transformation and view it as a, as a conformal transformation of a cylinder. The scale factor uh, that conformal transformation on the cylinder will have, it will be proportional to the scale factor that it had in flat space up to this rescaling of the matrix. Now let us take some correlation function of uh, fields in Euclidean space. And let us ask, how will it transform under conformal transformation which changed the metric on the cylinder? Since the two scale factors are related up to this rescaling, it means that we, if we rescale fields on the cylinder with respect to fields in the Euclidean space, we will get that their correlation functions will transform correctly with respect to conformal transformations of the cylinder. So let me write it down. So I, I claim that, uh, so I would like to define fields on the cylinder, sigma omega. So this is just a definition. I will, I will define them by this formula, one over uh, cosh sigma plus omega one uh, to the delta phi Euclidean. So uh, what I would like to have is that I would like to have that uh, the correlation functions uh, of fields on the cylinder, like transform correctly. depends on sigma omega. With respect to the scale factor on the cylinder. So this is the equation that I aim for. Now, the scale factor on the cylinder is related to the scale factor in flat space up to that rescaling factor. So if I rescale the fields by this formula, then the transformation rules on the in Euclidean space, they will map on the transformation rules on the cylinder. I'm not using this. I'm using the fact. Let me set, take a set of correlation function in Euclidean space, which transforms, somebody gives me a set of correlation functions, which transforms correctly under the Euclidean group. Conformal transformation. Conformal transformation. Conformal transformation. Find a dimensional group. Find a dimensional group. Then let me define another set of correlation functions on the cylinder by just rescaling the first set of correlation functions. Then that set of correlation functions will now transform correctly and the conformal transformations of the cylinder. Automatic. Do you agree? No? Well, OK, I have to convince you. Uh, no, but this is an important point, in fact, uh, because uh, so, so I have a transformation f x to x prime. And this transformation on in Minkowski space, there is a certain rescaling factor, lambda of x squared dx squared. Now, on the cylinder, so let me take the metric on the cylinder, uh, ds uh, cylinder squared. I take the same transformation and view it as transformation of the cylinder. Now, on the cylinder, I will have ds cylinder squared is going to be equal to lambda of x squared ds s, uh, okay, let's prime, ds prime squared, ds cylinder squared. 
But there's going to be an extra factor because of that, of that thing. Right? So times uh, sigma uh, cos sigma plus omega uh, cos sigma prime plus omega prime squared divided by cos sigma plus omega squared. So the correlation functions in Euclidean space, they were transforming with respect to this factor lambda x. I want that my correlation functions on the cylinder, they transform with respect to this whole factor. How to achieve that? Well, just rescale correlation functions by this formula, and you will achieve what you need. So what I'm saying is that the, re that the transformed correlation functions, they will transform the rescaled correlation functions, they will transform correctly and the conformal transformations on the cylinder. In particular, they will be invariant under all isometries of the cylinder. They will be invariant under, for example, they're going to be uh, translation invariant in the sigma direction. And this is, uh, I mean, you can, you can check this, uh, you, can, you can check this explicitly. Take a two-point function in Euclidean space, which is just one over x minus x prime squared, transform it into in the space. There are just some factors that you rescale away and you get it. Yeah. I mean, th that's an interesting question that you pose. But in order for this question to be uh, non-trivial, what I'm saying is this. Given conformal field theory on one manifold, which is flat space, I can define, I can define what I mean by correlation functions on another manifold, which is the cylinder. Now you're saying, well, I don't like your definition. I want to check whether my field theory is well invariant in the first place. For this question to be meaningful, you have to have an independent way of, comp of defining correlation functions on the cylinder. For example, if, there is, if your fe theory has a path integral definition, you can say, let me use my path integral compute correlation functions here and there and check if it agrees with this definition that I'm proposing. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying that it's natural, given correlation functions in Euclidean space, uh, to define another set of correlation functions on the cylinder by this formula. It's, I'm not saying that they came to, from the same path integral. I'm just saying that uh, by, by using this, uh, you know, view it as a definition. This definition is convenient because now I'm going to use this definition in order to extend correlation functions to, uh, to this Lorentzian, to this bigger space, this Lorentzian cylinder. Uh, but if we had a path integral definition, yeah, th then one could pose your question. It would, uh, like, because then would be an independent way to compute this correlation function. It would be an interesting question. So where 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 am I? I was uh, um, so l let me then restate the logic. I start with correlation functions in Euclidean space. I define another set of correlation functions on the cylinder just by rescaling every leg by this factor. I get another set of correlation functions, and. And it is that set of correlation functions that I'm going to analytically continue to the, uh, to the Lorentzian cylinder. And the way I'm going to do this is uh, is, is this. So I'm, I'm going to take a four-point function. So I have four points. So I have to continue uh, S1 is equal to some value, uh, no, sigma 1 is equal to some value 
epsilon 1 plus i s1. So I start with some real uh, value of sigma 1, epsilon 1, which I have to scale to 0. And simultaneously, I, uh, I build up the Minkowski time from 0 to some finite value s1 that I need. So this is my analytic continuation path. And I do the same with sigma 2, which is epsilon 2 plus i s2, and so on. And uh, given that um, uh, we already know from the Minkowski story that the OPE channel that, um, that works nicely uh, is always the one two channel, I'm going to pick so I'm, I'm going to pick epsilon 1 larger than epsilon 2, larger than epsilon 3, larger than epsilon 4. And I'm going to work in uh, phi 1, phi 2 channel. This is not a surprise if you already absorbed the Minkowski story. So what changes with respect to the calculation that we were doing before? Before, we were doing this analytic continuation where we kept x fixed. And we were continuing in x0 in time. Now we are doing something different. We keep omega fixed. We keep omega fixed. And we are doing analytic continuation in sigma. Well, unfortunately, I, I erased the, the corresponding formula with sigma. But you know, in the end, nothing changes. We, have, we, we pick omega. We pick sigma. We compute x's by this formula. Given x's, we have a conformal field theory. Given x's, we have four values of x's. We can compute u and v. Given u and v, we can compute z and z bar. Given z and z bar, we can compute rho and rho bar. Before our rho and rho bar, they were depending on times and on, on x's, on vector x's. Now they depend on times, on the sphere times, which are sigmas, and on omegas, the, the location of the sphere. So they depend on a different set of variables, but these are still some curves in, uh, in complex plane. You can still write down power series expansion in rho and rho bar. And so if rho and rho bar doesn't uh, cross the unit disk, then we know that the power series expansion will converge. So now the claim that we make is that if we work in this, uh, in this OPE channel 1, 2, then even if we use this hy hyperbolic change of coordinates with uh, sinh sigma, cos sigma plus omega, and so on, then uh, rho and rho bar never cross the unit disk. Again, that's something that we can prove. And so by doing this analytic continuation with this contour, uh, we define Lorentzian correlation functions on the whole cylinder, Lorentzian cylinder. And we can prove that, that they are distributions. Because again, there is the usual thing, power law bound, uh, Vladimir's theorem. All of this works also in this setting. So, uh, so that's the first thing that, uh, that we can do using, using this trick. Now, once you constructed this Lorentz and correlation functions on the cylinder, there are a few things that you have to show. You have to show what is the relation of the Lorentz functions on the cylinder that you constructed to the Minkowski correlation functions that we constructed using another analytic continuation contour. Because in one case, we kept angular positions on the cylinder fixed, omegas. In the other case, we kept Minkowski positions, fi uh, spatial position fixed axes. So the contours are not the same. You might wonder, OK, but we got uh, we got one set of distributions, which is on the Poincaré patch from Minkowski space, which we rescale. Or we got another set of distributions on the whole Lorentz and cylinder. But if Lucia and Mark are right, if their intuition was right, then these two sets of distributions, they have to agree on this patch. But for them to agree, the two paths, the two different paths that we use to define these distributions, there has to be some compatibility within them. In particular, you remember, uh, that there were some phases that I was talking about, that how many times z was going around the origin. So these phases, they have to be the same for both analytic continuation paths. 
Uh, it turns out that, uh, that the phases are the same, and so we can show that uh, indeed uh, uh, the two distributions agree on the Poincaré patch. Uh, so that's, uh, that's nice. And then another thing that, that you need to show is that uh, it would be nice to show that the distributions that you define on the Lorentzian cil cylinder, that they are causal on the Lorentzian cylinder. So that, that, that they compute. The Lorentzian cylinder is a very big space, but there is causality <coughs> relation between them with respect to the metric. Uh, we would like to show that, uh, that um, correlation functions that we define, they, de they respect this uh, notion of causality. For correlation functions in ADS-CFT, uh, this notion of causality, it follows from causality in the bulk. But here we, don't, we are not using AD ADS-CFT. We are proving that this construction is true for any conformal field theory. Uh, so, uh, so you have to think, uh, you have to think it uh, uh, a bit through. and. Uh, uh, there is some extra work to be done to, to prove that indeed these correlation functions are causal. And, um, but basically, uh, there is a smart argument that shows that if they are causal on the Poincaré patch, then, and if they are analytic, if they anal allow analytic extension, which is what we do, then they remain causal also on the, on the full uh, uh, Lorentzian cylinder. So there is a structure argument like that. So there is no, unfortunately, we don't have a, uh, a better argument. So, so this uh, pretty much cleans up the story of the Lorentzian cylinder. Uh, and uh, it brings me more or less to the end of my lectures. Uh, and maybe uh, at uh, maybe I would like to mention some open problems related to this uh, subject. I think uh, the biggest open problem is, is that um, we don't have a very clear idea how to show these things that we have shown for high point functions. So for four point functions, we found uh, a nice construction, but it was based uh, on the existence of the row variable and uh, on the existence of the convergent power series expansions in terms of the row variable. Now, if you go to high point functions, this uh, uh, method doesn't seem to work because uh, there are more channels and it doesn't look like there is a single variable that will be able to cover the whole uh, kinematic region and this uh, I think shows that um, well first of all I, I believe that there is an argument that will eventually it will be shown that even higher point functions are distributions in Minkowski space and on the Lorentzian cylinder uh, and maybe that uh, argument, when it will be found eventually, it probably will uh, be, will explain, will give an alternative explanation also for the four point function case. Because, okay, it might be that the explanation that you found for the four point function in terms of rho and rho bar is not the only explanation, and there is some smarter explanation uh, which would cover both four point function and high point function case. Uh, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting problem. I think it's an important problem, and uh, I encourage you to look for this explanation. Thank you.